Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful sunny day. Yeah. It was all the way up Route 9. So we decided to stop and get Abby a collage to get her all sugared up. So Ooh, nice. yeah, she's going to get us all going this morning. Yeah, I even gave her some loud instruments. So that'll be nice. Okay, March 20. Wow, March 28th. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so today we have uh, service and following the service we do have an adult Bible study in the library. All are welcome to that. On Tuesday at 7.30 in the morning there is a men's breakfast downstairs with a Bible study. Oh, I'm sorry, with a book study, excuse me. On Wednesday, pastor's Bible study via Zoom is at 6 p.m. Pastor John sends out the invitations. If you're not on the email list and you would like to be invited to that, again, please let us know. Lots of interesting things happen if you have it outside. Um, I was having it outside today, uh, this week, and I was glad I was muted. One of my neighbors was walking down the road. And he goes, hey, Mike. I'm like, hey, how are you? And he goes, have you seen a turtle with painted nails? Goes, no, not, not today. And, he, and he, said, he said, oh, my wife painted the nails. I'm like, great, I'm glad we clarified. <laughs> he said, so. So apparently his pet turtle got out. I, the search continues. So um, I don't know if they found her, found her or not, but we'll see. Um, so lots of interesting th things happen if you have it outside. All right. On uh, April 4th, I'm sorry, Friday, excuse me, Good Shepherd Food Bank, there is a pickup at 7.30. Volunteers are needed at 8 a.m. And very welcome, by the way, volunteers are. On April 4th is Easter Sunday. A little different that day. Services will be at 8 o'clock in the morning. Following service, we'll have a breakfast downstairs. Gary and myself are going to be cooking. I don't know if anyone else is helping out, but if you are looking to bring something, please let Gary know so we know what's coming and all that stuff. I believe there's an email chain going around for that. Um, this, I'm sorry, I missed something because um, John just told me about it. On, Thursday, we are having Monday Thursday with a light meal at 6 p.m., right? Yep. Okay, 6 p.m. I need to contact you to bring something, so if you're available, you can come. I'll call you up during the week or send you an email, what you could bring. Good deal. Okay, so we are at April 5th. There is a food cupboard at 10 a.m. Volunteers are needed to help pack boxes at 8.30 in the morning. And then Samaritan's Purse for this month, we're looking for um, school supplies, erasers, uh, solar powered calculators, safety scissors, pencils, notebooks, color pencils, and uh, all donations are welcome. Uh, just like Tina said last week though, you don't have to follow this list if you're in the store and you see a really cool deal on something and you want to pick up a whole bunch of them. And Put them in the nice baskets we have out there. If you want to bring a basket home and fill it up, you're more welcome to do that too. All right. Is there any other announcements before we get to the birthdays? Yes, um, we're in between food cupboards again, so we do have a few items downstairs from the deli. Sandwiches, and there's a tub of Greek salad that we can split up. Um, no produce today, but just, just some things so. oh, Good deal. Any other announcements? I think we have a birthday. Yes, I was, yeah, I was just going to do that. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, happy birthday, Marsha. Happy birthday to you. Thanks to the Lord for his good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is good. He has made his light to shine upon us. <coughs> Bind the feastal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For a steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, especially, it's good to see Herb and Barb back in attendance as Herb's recovering from Barb B. I mean, his surgery. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to share something. Uh, those of you that have Table Talk, um, this weekend, uh, the reading really, I think, applies to, to what we've gone through. It, the title is The Joy of Going to the Lord's House. If you are able to worship weekly for many years, you may begin to take that blessing for granted. When that routine is threatened or lost for a time, you may be reawakened to the joy of worshiping the Lord together. The old saying, you don't know what you have until it is gone, begins to ring true. When believers are able to return, they say with the psalmist, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, which is Psalms 122.1. This reaction to the experience of loss and restoration speaks volume about spiritual health. True believers still go through times when they cannot attend the worship of the Lord, or times when peace seems to be in short supply. We still, however, have an enduring hope in Christ, who through his death is our peace. Even now, his church is being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Through challenging times, may we be a people who continue to love the house of God. I just thought that was so fitting for this time. So. Uh, let's turn in our hymnals to number 298. We'll stand together. We'll do the reading. We're going to do 299, 300, and 301. So let's stand together, page 298, in our hymnals, and do the reading together. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
Father, as we worship you this morning, as we come before you, we think of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the gift that you gave us in him. We think of the glory that he received that week before his passion was really shown us. Father, this morning as we worship you, we worship you as the great I am. As Ego Ami, I am, I am. Father, you are our God and there is none other. As we worship you, let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, the only reason we're here this morning is because of the completed, finished work of Christ on the cross for each and every one of us. And it was Jesus that taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. week's catechism can be found in your bulletins. And the question is, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? Since the fall, no mere human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly, but consistently breaks it in thought, word, and deed. You can find this in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. One of these days, Gary and I are going to figure out how to get what's here up there. But it, until we do, let me read to you from Ann Clemmer in the Congo. We've spoken about her quite often, but um, this is, today's music was enhanced by a trombone that was gifted by the Schwartz family from our home church in Maine. So missions can be anything. The first time he played alongside the choir, he's thrilled to have quality trombone because he'd been using not a quality one. Um, our friends continue to bless the faithful here in Congo. So I'm just gonna play it and I think we can, you can't see the picture, I'm sure. So missions, when you think about missions, it's not just pencils and erasers and that sort of thing. Anything can be a mission to someone else who doesn't have it.
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming even the death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and on the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning as the church, as the Clifton Baptist Church, we come collectively, corporately, as this body, lifting our voice to you because we believe in faith, by faith, through faith, that you are our God. We hold up your name because you are the God of the universe. You are sovereign. You are above all things. For all things were made by you and through you. Father, we worship you. And Father, we know at times we struggle in our worship of you because in these finite bodies, in these temporal tents you have given us, we'll never know what the eternal, what the divine truly is until we stand in your presence. But Father, we have your presence now by your Holy Spirit because of the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ because of his willingness to die on our behalf and pay the debt to ransom us back to you. Father, what a wonderful God you are. What a plan of salvation, what a design. And to those who don't understand it, the cross is foolishness because they're perishing. So we ask this morning as we worship you that we would understand how enormous this is, that we get to worship you, the God of the universe, who spoke in all things and came into being. Father, this morning as we come before you, we want to be a confessing people. We want to be a people that lay our lives out before you. We ask the blessings that you can pour down on us to come, but Father, it's because we need them, not because we deserve them. It's because we need your healing hand. We need your love. We need a Savior. So when we're not living as you want us to be, when we're still fighting the old life, 
when we still find ourselves enslaved to the things that are in opposition to you, we ask that you forgive us. Your word's clear that if we confess our sins, you are faithful. Father, what wonderful words. You are faithful. I may drop the ball, we may drop the ball, but you never fail. So your word says you are faithful and you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, what an awesome God you are. What a forgiving, loving, caring God you are. So this morning, forgive us our sins. Forgive the sins of this preacher as we bring ourselves before you now. Father, thank you. Thank you for the good. Thank you for even the bad things that happen in our lives. Because we know that all things work together for good to those who love you. Father, you are a wonderful God. And we know that everything in our lives has a purpose. And you have a purpose for our life. You know the number of our days. You know the number of hairs even on our head. And again, as your word says, not one sparrow can fall to the ground without your knowledge. So, Father, how much greater do you take care of us? And as Jesus said, even the lilies in the field, as beautiful as they are, how much more, because they're here a day and gone, do you care for us? Father, thank you. Thank you for the blessings that you pour down, that you share with us. Father, now we pray as a church for some of the things that we've discussed, for all the people that are involved with our little congregation, for those who are within the sphere of our influence, we ask that as much as it counts on us that we live with all men in peace, and that we always hold up Christ, and that we live according to your word. What a wonderful God you are, and the peace that you give us comes because of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you now, in Jesus' name. I have to correct something the pastor said earlier. He said that this, uh, I hate to do that. You know, all right. Um, he said that this experience of herbs has, uh, mellow, has made him mellow. I would have said mellower, <laughs> not mellow. But um, I just wanted to comment, um, before the service, like Deb, and, Deb 1 and Deb 2 were playing the prelude. That's the only way to identify them. Thing one, thing two. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just so enjoyable. And then this, the off tour that Norma and, and Deb played, wow. You know, it's like, in my opinion, we could have almost ended the service right there. I mean, what a powerful arrangement of that song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is my story. I mean, it's so beautiful. I have to share this. Gary sent out an email the other day for our Easter breakfast, and he was asking for contributions. And Deb number two responded and said she would bring cinnamon rolls. So I, I was going to send an email, but then I didn't know if I should. So I told her yesterday, I said, the elders had decided that since we didn't know the quality of her cinnamon rolls, that she should have to make a batch and bring them this week. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't sure how that would go over, so I didn't do it. Anyways, let's turn, we're going to go into our blue books, our praise and worship. We're going to turn to number 81, Hosanna. So hopefully you have a blue book. Let's
we're transitioning between the end of the book of Isaiah and going into Ephesians. Um, I've taken these two weeks, for those who weren't here last week and heard my explanation, I am taking these two weeks to follow more or less traditionally the fact that we're having Palm Sunday today and Easter Sunday next week. And I make sure that everybody who leaves today gets a palm. Palms that remind you of what happened on that day when Jesus came into Jerusalem, coming out of Bethany, coming down into Jerusalem as he marched in. The people are thinking, this is the guy. This is the guy. I worked with an Arab. His name was Raja Ramadan. And Raja had opened seven Hiltons around the world as a master chef. And Raja and I got to know each other in New York. I was working as the engineer at the home that we were at. And it was a, a uh, Lebanese Syrian home uh, run by Lebanese Syrian people. Uh, St. Nicholas home, it was Orthodox, so it was kind of different. Uh, Orthodox Christian, by the way, Syrian, the Coptic church is a well-known, goes back to the time of Jesus. Anyway, Raja would always say, if he tried to remember somebody's name, he couldn't. And he'd go, that guy, with his Arabic accent, Egyptian, he was Egyptian. So his Egyptian accent, that guy. What guy? That guy. And I could never figure it out. When Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, I wondered if there were people saying, that guy. That's the guy. Because they're thinking, he's going to do something. He's going somewhere. And traditionally, we always have palms to give away because we remind them what they did that day. They spread palm leaves out. They laid him on the ground and they sang, Hallelujah, glory to God in the highest. We're going to see Rome out of here. That's what they were thinking. We're going to see our lives better. We're going to become Jews again. We're going to have free Israel. We're going to have everything we want to be a nation. Didn't they miss the boat on that one? Sometimes when you're looking at that guy, You've got to understand what guy you're looking at so that you get the full understanding. Our text today, I'm using one verse, Galatians. I'm in the fourth chapter. I'm going to preach on the fourth chapter, the fourth verse, Galatians 4.4. 4. And I want to read some scripture before that. We'll give you the first seven verses of Galatians 4. Is it seven? Maybe I spoke too quick. My age is showing. Yesterday, for some reason, I, I got as sick as a dog um, sitting in my office, and I didn't know if I was having a stroke or a heart event or what, but it was a different day. And uh, eventually, I got my composure back. I went back over, sat on the recliner, and I didn't move until 6 o'clock yesterday evening, and we went out to dinner. and. Uh, I felt better, but my mind wasn't there, and I was sitting between the two bathrooms on that staircase, trying to figure out what I was doing sitting there. I had gone to get some water to water my little plants, my garden that I'm starting to develop in my office, but I forgot that because I didn't have anything in my hand, and, and finally it all came to me, and I'm saying, well, you know, how do you figure it out? So telling the elders this morning, Mark was saying, wasn't there supposed to be a test, you know, you, you checked around to see if you're having a stroke. And if you got the mind to do that, then okay, if you don't. Those who are into philosophy, and I, probably most of you are, uh, Descartes used to say, I think, so I am. <laughs> Yesterday I was thinking about that, I'm saying, well, I'm clear of mind right this moment, so I guess I'm okay. And I got back to the office, Dave said I look bad. I thought he was referring to every day, uh, or just for the moment, uh, but I did go back over. But anyways, I, I didn't know where I was. The time was scary. 
The title of my sermon this morning is the beginning of the verse, in the fullness of time. So let's look at Galatians 4, and in fact, I'll read the first seven verses. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is, a, a, no, he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until that date, or the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba. Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's speak to the Father for a moment, if we may. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this word. Because we know that through it, you're explaining to us that you have an exact plan. And this was a picture of part of it. Speak to our hearts this morning. Give us something new, something fresh, I pray. Not by any device of this man or any man, but by the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes when we, we tell people things, they don't get it. They, they don't see. There's a story of a guy who goes to the circus. He wants to get a job at the circus. So he says to the circus guy, I want a job. The guy... The ring, you know, the ringmaster or whatever. He looks at it and he says, what can you do? He says, I can, I, I can impersonate a bird. <coughs> the guy looks at him, really? What's the big deal? Anybody can chirp. Get out of here. I don't want to be bothered with you. And with that, the guy started whacking his arms and he flew out the window. <laughs> he should have tried it out, shouldn't he? Sometimes when we see things, we don't get it. The reason we come together Sunday after Sunday after Sunday is to worship a living God. We come because we believe by faith that not only is God there, but he cares about you and me intimately. And he did so much past tense, that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. And let me give you a little quick background what was happening in Galatia. You see, these people in that area, when he wrote to Galatia, it wasn't just the church at Galatia. He was writing to the churches in the area. So if somebody sent a letter to the Clifton United Baptist Church, they're hoping that we're going to give it to the Otis Church and East Brook Church and the church down the road. We're going to pass it around to be read because we believe it is special. And as Paul wrote that, he's specifically, and we're going to see that when we get into Ephesians, doing this to speak to the people. And especially those in the Galatian area because they were going through some things with some folks known as Judaizers. They were saying, well, you new Christians, you're okay, but you know what? You're not walking really with the Jewish way. And they were putting a little bit of the old Jewish way on them. And these are Gentiles. And these Jewish Christians were out there trying to make them do some other things. For those who hadn't been, they wanted them circumcised. For other people, and they tell them they have to obey the law. Paul's writing this letter and saying, we're not under the law anymore. And he gives a lot of explanation, but then he gets to this fourth chapter in this one verse here, and he says, in the fullness of time. Just prior to that, when I read the start of the fourth chapter, he says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child. He is saying that for us who accept Christ Jesus, we are heirs of what God has promised us through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're promised the gates of heaven. We're promised eternity. 
We're promised a new home. We saw that going through Isaiah. We are promised so much. And why would you want to maybe forsake that by putting yourself under a bunch of rules and regulations? When I was a kid growing up as a Baptist, Baptists were really strict. We used to know that the Pentecostals were too. You know, we had a saying. We don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't associate with those who do. You know, you, you had rules. You couldn't have cards in the house. Girls, you couldn't paint your fingernails. You had to wear dresses, couldn't wear pants. There was rules, rules, rules. Well, rules don't change the heart. Rules don't make you a better person. And that's what Paul's point here. Which one of us could keep the law? So in Christ Jesus, we are His without the law. We are His because of grace. And that grace comes to us because we have placed faith in the risen Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's it. I shared, I think I was sharing with Herb and, and Mark, and then I, I touched upon it again this morning with, with Dave. I was reading something from R.C. Sproul this week, and he was talking about the woman who felt like she wasn't forgiven. You see, remember I asked you last week, explain to me the gospel. Explain to me the gospel. If I was to give you a test right now and say, because we all throw the word around gospel, gospel, gospel. Churches have it on their title, full gospel, church, full gospel, mission, full gospel, 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 gospel. It comes from a Greek word. That means good news. But explain it. What is the good news? The good news, if you had to sit down and take a quick write a paragraph, is that we were separated from God by our sin. And God sent us his son, Jesus Christ, in the fullness of time. To redeem us. So that's the gospel. And sometimes we forget that and we get all discombobulated trying to put rules and regulations and things we have to do in, in our faith to make a religion. So if we come to church every week and sit in the same pew and we do all these things, we get this warm feeling. So this woman said to R.C. Sproul, I don't feel forgiven. Pray again. She said, you don't get it, R.C. I just told you I prayed and I don't feel forgiven. You see, because the gospel is good news because it says all we have to do is come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. There's nothing else I can do. I realize, it. I get this now, that because of my sin, I'm separated from you and there's nothing. I can't buy it, I can't, I can't earn it, I can't do anything but by your grace. I can't keep the law perfectly. How many of you can go down I-95 and drive at the speed limit perfectly? No, you can't. <laughs> you think you can. <laughs> so we can't do it. So R.C. said, go ahead and pray again. She says, I told you, I'm praying. You're not getting it. He says, no, you're not getting it. He says, I'm going to tell you one more time. You need to pray. And this time you need to ask for God's forgiveness for being so arrogant. Because what's the Bible say? If we confess our sins, He is faithful if you feel like He did. No. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray that God forgives you for your arrogance saying that it couldn't happen with you. He said, I wasn't doing it to make her upset. R.C. said, I realized she was a stockbroker. She was trying to do it the Smith Barney way. Earn it. <laughs> the old fashioned way. You can't earn a righteousness with God. And here's something that maybe you haven't thought about. Jesus Christ is a curse to us if we do not accept him. Because what's it say in John 3? I did not come into the world to condemn the world. Why? The world's already condemned. So the curse 
in Christ is this. <laughs> if we don't accept them, we're done. Actually, we never got started. We're dead people walking, as they say in the penitentiary for those who have a life sentence or a death sentence. We were dead people walking. We, there's a death sentence upon us. We cannot please God. That's what makes grace so amazing. Amazing grace, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Amazing grace. So Paul here is saying to you guys, whoever they are, whoever we are today, whoever will be in the future, that when we think we can do something to earn God's love, to earn a righteousness before him, we're off the, we're, we're, it ain't happening. It isn't happening. In God's timetable, when the exact religious, cultural, and political conditions demanded, which were demanded by his perfect plan, were in place, Jesus came into the world to do that for us. To give us a way of getting back into relationship with a living and loving God. Jewish texts often speak of the fulfillment of appointed times in history as a way of recognizing God's perfect wisdom in and his sovereignty over history. Some commentators have compared the fullness of the time, especially as you read in the New American Standard, to how ripe Greco-Roman culture was for the spread of the gospel. Why do we say that? Well, because it was the um, Appian Way. They had built a road system. It was like the Eisenhower system for us in America. You go, if you don't know, odd roads go what? North and south. Even roads go east and west. If you've got a three-digit highway, if it starts with an odd number, it's a spur. If it's an even number, it's a go-around. We have a system. Eisenhower developed it, and it started, in fact, his, his, he first got introduced to it in 1929, because the United States Army went across the Lincoln Highway from New Jersey to San Francisco. And most of the road after you got past Pacifini, New Jersey, was a cow path. <laughs> And then after being in Germany, he fell in love with the Second World War with the Audubon that the Germans had made, their road system. So in the time of Jesus, the Romans had built this awesome road system so that they could march troops as quickly as possible to go quell any kind of problems. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about the accepted the language by rule, by the government, at the time was Greek and Latin. Every town that received and had a church at this time spoke their own language. All the towns had their own language. So if somebody opened their mouth, they'd go, ah, those Mariahville people, you know? <laughs> or, or they'd say something else, you would say, well, I know they're from Amherst. You know, oh no, that Waltham crowd. Oh, well, you know they're from Bangor, you know. People in Prescott, we know everybody in the state was different, you know, because we didn't have a, a real accent up there. So, so the language was pretty much the same. The road system was pretty much this unbelievable so you could travel. And, and it's estimated that in 20 years, on a horse, by boat, or walking, Paul covered 10,000 miles. That's an estimation. 10,000 miles. In the fullness of time. Well, you could have said, well, you know, if God's bringing us salvation, why didn't he bring it right after we sinned? Okay, Adam, okay, Eve, you sinned, let's fix this right now. Because he loved us so much and gave us this right to choose, gave us free will, he wanted us to figure this out. And we needed to understand the severity of our sin against God. There's a lot of talk right now about inoculations, about getting shots, about all the other stuff. Get it, don't get it, whatever. 
I'm not getting into that. But the science behind it is this, that some of these things have to work themselves out before they can really understand the cure. And let's not just play with the pandemic. Let's go back to, in fact, Dave and I were talking about this morning, polio, chicken pox, other things. And sometimes God allows us to suffer so we can figure out how bad we are off. And I get really upset every time I hear politicians say, well, God didn't do this, or God didn't fix this, we did. See what happened to that guy. I mean, did I say that? I didn't say that. So anyways, that's not what I'm going by. What I'm saying is God's allowing us to understand how bad off we are. The conditions we're in. The sin that we have. So now he's given us his son, and he's waited till this time, the fullness of time. He allowed Israel to go through what they go through. So much like our world today, at the time of Galatians 4.4, 4, when Paul was writing, he explained that when Jesus came, it was perfect, the timing. Politicians today are pushing back on the Christian right by coming out with a group that are gay and Christian, a group that's political and Christian, people that are this and that and call themselves Christians. And our culture is changing at such a rate that no matter where we look, what we once seen as a Judeo-Christian safe ground is now shifting sand. I've never seen a world, that, especially a country like ours, that supposedly call themselves Christians, and I've never believed that. Now you can find anybody <clears throat> believing anything, and they're okay. Well, I've once I mean to tell you this. Unless you're following this, unless you're adhering to this, unless you're walking as people of the book, we're not believers. We're fooling ourselves. We're going off on our own tangents and doing our own thing. The tragedy in Atlanta, a young man, and, and I, I didn't know, it took me days to find out why all the flags were flying half mass, and, and I never knew that we were going to celebrate, even though it was tragic as it was, and it should have never happened. And it's an affront to God that these women were killed. I never knew we were going to drop the flags for people who were practicing the sex trade because they were murdered. They shouldn't have been murdered, especially by a young man who claimed to be a Christian who was dealing with his own sexual temptations. He lost his mind. And his church in Georgia, last week, Sunday night, practiced what we call church discipline. The church met, they ran, the press was there, of course. You know how, the, you know how that is. They emptied the church, all but members, and closed the door and did what a family, a church family is supposed to do. And they excommunicated that young man from that congregation because the life he was living was not as a believer. Sometimes we're afraid to do that. You say the wrong thing, Pastor, they won't be out next Sunday. I'd rather be a doorman in the house of the Lord than live and dwell in the tents of the wicked. That's what the Bible says. Tell me I'm not fit anymore. Make me a, a mechanic. You know, fixing whatever we're going to be driving around in heaven if we're driving around anything. I, I, I don't care. But I'm going to serve the Lord. As far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So the tragedy in Atlanta, a young man trying to just keep lust away from himself, was destroyed and destroyed those who practiced it. But our anger doesn't bring about the righteous living God requires, James 1.20 says. So when we get upset about these things, we're not to get upset about these things. We can be upset, but we need to squash our anger. 
I shared with her this week, uh, the other night I had a dream. Now don't call me Martin. <laughs> and in that dream I was dealing with a bunch of people and I was teaching a class in a, in a college and I was teaching that class on, I don't know, timing or something and somebody stood up and they ticked me off. They said something I didn't like and I blasted them. I lost it. And the next day I came back and in front of that group of people I had to apologize because they knew I was a pastor. And I had to say that was not controlling my emotions. We're not to go out half cop like this young man did because he couldn't control his emotions. He went out and killed these women. That's not the reaction. Our anger about anything doesn't bring about God's righteousness. We have to become mature in our faith, leaning on God for our support and not our strength or devices. So in Galatians here, as Paul is writing to that church, he compares this fulfillment to the point in which a boy attains maturity and is considered an adult, about 13 or 14 years old. If you're 13 in the Jewish world, you have a bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. If you're a young lady, you have a bar mitzvah. They do have it for, for girls also, just not a guy thing. Some people get upset over that. I don't know why. I remember the years ago when I was studying, this, the, doing the background for this. Uh, at Eastbrook, I got finished preaching one Sunday, and a woman walked up to me. This is probably eight, nine years ago now. And she says, you preached a wonderful sermon. I thank you. And you talked a lot about Father God, but I didn't hear anything about Mother God. Who's that? I said, all I can tell you is that God identifies himself in the male, in the masculine. Is he a man? No, God's not a man. He's a spirit. The Bible teaches us that. But he re represents himself as a man, as our father. Jesus told me to pray to my father who art in heaven. Jesus is a man. There's no doubts there. I know in this world of sexual confusion or choice that people go off the other end. So anyways, 13. So here Paul is saying that a young man, he's using this analogy so we can understand, born under law means that Jesus was obligated to keep the law of Moses. Jesus was under the obligation to obey the Father. And he was our example, your example, of how one should live for God. Because God has the benefits that he wants for us lined up. And if we go against that, which he's willing to let us do. Isn't that ironic? Isn't it ironic? You, you really have to fight to be bad, don't you? You really got to struggle to be bad, don't you? Or go the other way. Or, or do you? I mean, think about that. If you want to do something against God, it's really, I mean, it's like... Ah, no, it's easy. Anybody can be bad. Anybody can go the other way. It's, it is hard. It's a struggle to follow God. And I get that. It's, it's hard. It's hard in the morning to get up and remember to pray. It's hard to get up in the morning and remember that, Lord, you, you're my God. I want to give you first fruits every day. I want to come and say, look, thank you for putting me in my right mind this morning. Because I wondered about it yesterday sitting between the bathrooms. Thank you that I'm up and my feet are on the ground. Thank you that I can thank you. Thank you for being God. And even through the bad things happening in life and the bumps and bruises, if I never, Andre, Andre sings it, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. What, what words? What words? I know the things that have happened in my life. I, I, I look back and I say, Lord, thank you for where you brought me. Thank you you took me out of the desert. Thank you you took me out of Egypt. We're getting ready to celebrate Passover, Easter, all locked together. You know, thank you for where you brought us from, the spiritual sense of that. God sent forth his son. Look what this verse says, verse 4. Let's look at it. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
So as a father set the time for the ceremony of his son, say for a bar mitzvah, becoming of age and being released from the guardians, stewards, and tutors, so God sent his son at the precise moment to bring all, listen loved ones, all who believe out from under bondage to the law. A truth Jesus repeatedly affirmed. John 12, 49, Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me. The Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. And that commandment was what to say and what to speak. See, when he was born under the law, he did everything he was supposed to do as a Jew. He told them, I didn't come to take away the law, I came to fulfill it. So if you think we're doing a whole new thing and we throw everything out with the bath, we throw the baby out with the bathwater, you're wrong. I'm showing you the purpose for all things, Jesus said, and I'm fulfilling them. Because without accepting him, we are under a curse. We are dead people walking. The only hope we have in eternity of dwelling with him is by understanding who Jesus is and accepting him. And that the Father sent Jesus into the world teaches his pre-existence as the eternal second member of the Trinity. There is a denomination, more than one, one of them calls themselves the New Reformed denomination, telling everybody else who is Trinitarian that we are wrong and that it's a heresy and there's only one God. Jesus said the Father and I are one. So they might be wrong. Jesus said the Father and I are one. We serve a Trinitarian God. It's a God. He is a God who loves us and he demonstrates himself to us in three persons. And when you try to sit down and work all that out with a piece of paper and pencil, you're not going to be able to do it. Why? Because we live in these finite temporal bodies. He's an eternal God. And here we see the pre-existence of him. In Romans 8.3 and 8.4, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. God has given us his son. And Jesus is living to show this is how you get it. Because we don't get it. We say, Lord, we, we mess up. And yeah, we're going to mess up because we're still living in these old bodies. Sin still controls us. You know, uh, in ancient times, some people practiced this, and I don't want you getting all worked up and upset. But if you killed somebody, the penalty was that you were chained to the dead body. Can you imagine being chained to the person you killed? Not for five minutes, but for great lengths of time. Watching that body deteriorate. Watching probably until the worms started coming in and out. And in this life, when we come to Jesus Christ and ask him to take control of our lives, the problem is that the old life is still chained to us. And it's like we're dragging a dead man around. Because in Christ Jesus, we're told we become a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. We should be rejoicing every day that we had the opportunity to say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you that I can hear the word, your word. I can read it. I can study it. I can look to walk with you closer every day. Lord, thank you for what you do. But do we do that? Because sometimes we're distracted. That old body is still hanging on there. It's distracting us from living the riches that God has given us. Living as princes and princesses in the kingdom. 
We are children of the King. We have all the rights to the royalty that God offers us through His Son, Jesus Christ, because He paid the price for us and ransomed us back to Him. And Paul goes on in Romans 8, 3 and 4, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who now, if we're in Christ now, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So some of you who are caught up in that old Looney Tune cartoon where you got the little angel sitting on one shoulder and the devil, you know, and sitting on the other, and they're arguing, trying to get your attention. Well, yeah, in a way, that might be some reality to that, but it's really baloney. Do you want to serve your master? And he gets the right to be our master because he paid the price for us by dying on a cross. You see, these palms that remind us of Palm Sunday were laid down one week as they're singing hallelujah. But next Sunday they're singing crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. How fickle we are as people. Crucify him. And Paul goes on to say, that in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who we'll walk again, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, it's the Spirit of Christ in us. It's the righteousness of Christ that we're robed in that keeps us from standing and having the penalty any longer. We're not under the curse. We're not under the curse anymore if you're in Christ Jesus. So he says, born of a woman. I'm looking at the clock. Born of a woman. This emphasizes Jesus' full humanity. Not merely his virgin birth. Jesus had to be fully God for his sacrifice to be of the infinite worth needed to atone for sin. But he also had to be fully man so he could take upon himself the penalty of sin as our. Excuse me. Let me make this a little more personal. So he could take on the penalty and be the substitute for your, your sin. And mine. We can say our, but your sin. Because I sin, Christ died for me. Jesus was born of a woman. He was human. He was born as a Jew. He was subject to God's law and fulfilled it perfectly. Remember when John was baptizing him? What did John say? This is to fulfill the, the call for righteousness. Uh, he was taken to the temple. He was brought in for the brit, the circumcised. He was presented as they do. He did everything according to the Jewish law to fulfill it. Jesus is our fulfillment. He didn't take away the law. He fulfilled it on your behalf because we couldn't and on my behalf because I couldn't. His death bought freedom for us who were enslaved to sin so that we could be adopted into God's family. See, so that's the argument in John, the first chapter. When John writes John 1.1, 1, 1, he says it's not by the will of man, not by, not by some kind of luck, chance of luck. You know, once we accept who Christ is, we become children of God. First, uh, John 1, 11 and 12. We become children of God. So now you can do what? When you're praying to him, you can say, Abba, Father. Didn't he say that in verse 6? Verse 6, if your Bibles are still open, and I hope they are. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What's Abba mean? Dad. If you know any Jew, it's daddy. Daddy. Say, Abba. Abba. We have Christ. We have the Spirit of God living in our hearts when we accept Christ as our personal Savior. And that gives us the right to call the eternal God of the universe, Dad. Now, don't anybody get upset with me when I say this. When I hear people pray, Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. What God? I got this great privilege 
Of course you can. I don't go in, I, I never went into my father's house and said, Mr. Mr. Walsh. <laughs> I never went into my father's house and said, Mr. Walsh. Dad. <coughs> Think about that. We have a personal relationship with the God who spoke. And to give your mind and these finite bodies a little taste of eternity, we get to call Dad the God who spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden. <coughs> we get to speak to the God who said, Abraham, Abram, move. Go to Haran. Isaac, Jacob, Paul. No. Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? <coughs> Excuse me. And he's the one that says, John, Mike, <coughs> A, her. He's going to say it to Spud one day, Gary. Dad, Dad's calling. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling to you and to me, come home. It doesn't say come somewhere we've never been before. He says come home. He says we're sons already. That's what Paul's writing here in Galatians. We're already sons if we believe that Jesus is the Christ and we get to call our Father, Dad. And then again, I point back to you as we prepare to close. It's under the law. Like all men, Jesus was obligated to obey God's law. And unlike anyone else, however, he perfectly obeyed the law. His sinlessness made him the unblemished sacrifice for our sins. We needed a lamb that had no defect, no blemish. And what did John say when he saw him? Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God gave us his son. Those who were under the law, they couldn't fulfill the law. We who didn't have the law, we had a law that was written on our hearts. Isn't that what Paul tells us in Romans? Our consciences should tell us because we can see all that God made. Jesus kept it all. We can't earn it or buy it. It comes by grace and grace alone. This morning, question to you to think about today. As Jesus, we think about him marching into Jerusalem so many years ago, is he marching in your heart? Are you giving him first place in your heart? Does your heart belong to the King of Kings, the Son of David? Hosanna to him in the highest. It's a question we have to ask ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We pray again for your word, but we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for what you have given us in your gospel. Be with our hearts this morning. If there's anyone here that's questioning in their mind what, what they're to do, what choice they should make, let them flee from the curse. Let them embrace life. Let them come unto Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn our hymnals to number 320. Beneath the cross of Jesus. And let's stand and sing together. We'll sing all four verses.
Father, may we glory in the cross of Jesus. May we glory not because of anything we've done, but Father, because of the work that you've done. Mm. Father, may we come to you under that cross. May we look at you and remember that that cross is now empty because we serve our risen Savior. And we know that you're at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for each and every one of us as sons of God, as children of God. And Father, for these things we praise you. Now may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon every child of God and bring the unsaved unto Jesus Christ until our Lord shall come. Amen.